And I'm going to go ahead and start our recording. Thank you so much. Welcome everyone. This is the National Girls Collaborative Project National Webinar, Tecnolo Chicas, Transforming the T in STEM. We're so happy to have you here with us today for this great webinar and panel of fantastic women working in computer science and learning in computer science and technology. Um, just some small housekeeping things before we get started. Live transcription is activated. If you need help finding that on your computer, you can message my colleague Kata Lucas and she can give you some pointers and how to make that appear on your screen. Please feel free to use the chat box to ask questions throughout the webinar. We will be tracking those and we'll have time for questions at the end of today's session. Um, also, you can use that chat box to share insights and resources. We really like to see conversation happening in there. And with that, I'm going to end our poll. It looks like we have a great mix of folks today, people who might be community members and attending programming, informal educators, professors, students, librarians. So thank you all so much for joining us today. And as we get started, I'm gonna just go to our next slide. So this webinar is partially in celebration of Hispanic Heritage Month. So National Hispanic Heritage Month runs from September 15th to October 15th in celebration of the cultures and contributions of American citizens whose ancestors came from Spain, Mexico, the Caribbean, and Central and South America. The day September 15th is significant because it is the anniversary of independence for Latin American countries, Costa Rica, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, and Nicaragua. In addition, Mexico and Chile celebrate their independence days on September 16th and September 18th, respectively. Also, Columbus Day or Dia de la Raza, which is October 12th, falls within this 30-day period. So there are a lot of great things to celebrate around Hispanic and Latina heritage during the month of Hispanic Heritage Month. Um, we also wanted to take a moment and recognize the importance of terminology. Hispanic and Latinx communities represent a diaspora of different racial backgrounds, including African, Indigenous, European, and Asian heritages. Historically, people who originated from Latin America referred to themselves as Latino and Latina. However, recently the terms Latinx and Latine are more widely used to be inclusive of all gender identities. Identities are intersectional, so don't be afraid to ask people how they prefer to identify themselves. And with that bit of context around our webinar today, I am going to take a moment and introduce you to the National Girls Collaborative Project. The vision of the National Girls Collaborative Project is to support and create science, technology, engineering, mathematics, or STEM experiences that are as diverse as the world we live in. To do this, National Girls Collaborative Project creates and collaborates with a network of advocates to promote equity and transform STEM for all girls and youth. NGCP exists because today's STEM experiences continue to lack diversity. Many young people do not identify with the field. To create change, our work empowers providers, educators, leaders, and youth themselves. NGCP believes STEM skills can be acquired by anyone and fostered in everyone. Our initiatives build confidence and create a community of lifelong STEM activators. Through the power of collaboration, we spark curiosity and develop a passion for STEM. We share resources and solutions with a coalition of leaders and via our website, newsletters, online databases, social media, and webinars like this one. NGCP also strengthens the capacity of programs by producing and sharing exemplary practices, research, and program models. When programs are stronger and more sustainable, girls and youth are better served. We distribute these resources in accessible formats such as train the trainer programs, partnerships, and online platforms. And finally, we leverage our network of girls serving STEM programs, advocates, and youth so that together we can create the tipping point for gender equity in STEM. The National Girls Collaborative Project engages in many activities virtually and nationally, as well as through local collaboratives. NGCP partners with organizations to scale and deliver content such as the Leap into Science National Network in partnership with the Franklin Institute 
and the Million Girl Moonshot in partnership with STEM Next and the Mott After School State Networks, serving hundreds of educators via large local networks. NGCP is working with Lida Hill Philanthropies and has launched the If Then Collection, a digital library housing photos, videos, and other media of women in STEM fields. These media are available at no cost. NGCP also hosts the Girls Advisory Board. The Girls Advisory Board helps to review and provide feedback on current National Girls Collaborative Project initiatives and assist in forming the future direction of the NGCP. NGCP manages the Connectory, the largest national database of STEM opportunities. The Connectory also provides ways for program providers to connect and collaborate with each other. Fab Femmes is an international database of female role models from many STEM fields. They are passionate about the work they do and are ready to connect with programs to spark girls' interests. We offer regular webinars, such as this one, focused on research and exemplary practices to help our networks grow and thrive. And locally, state collaborative leadership teams offer convenings providing professional development, mini grants for innovative projects when funding is available, as well as they distribute their own regular newsletters spotlighting local resources. The National Girls Collaborative Project has been partially funded by the National Science Foundation since 2002. We began as the Northwest Girls Collaborative Project fo focused on Washington and Oregon. And as we presented our collaboration model to others, we were invited to expand across the United States. While NGCP programs and partners are located in every state, we have 33 collaboratives serving 41 states, facilitating collaboration between 42,500 organizations who serve 20.2 million girls and 10 million boys. And for those of you just joining us, we would love to see you introduce yourself in the chat. Let us know who you are, where you're joining from, where you're located. And um, a reminder to please use the chat throughout the webinar for questions as well. We will have time for Q&A at the end of our session today. And with that, I am thrilled to introduce our speakers today. Today, we will first be joined by Yvonne de la Pena, PhD, who is going to share information about the Tecnologicas initiative. Yvonne is passionate about computer science, coding, and making careers in tech accessible through education. She started her professional journey as a software engineer after obtaining her BS in computer science from the University of Texas at Austin. She discovered her true passion, prompted by her experience being a part of the MIT UCLA team that developed Scratch, while pursuing her PhD in education at the University of California, Los Angeles. Currently, Yvonne leads Tecnologicas, an initiative from the National Center for Women in Information Technology, NCWIT, and the Televisa Foundation to inspire young women to pursue careers in STEM by highlighting the stereotype shattering stories of Latina technologists. Previously, she was director of Bridge Up STEM at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. Outside of work, Yvonne is a member of the Board of New York Tech Alliance, an organization that connects businesses, startups, entrepreneurs, nonprofits, educational institutions, government, and people from all parts of the New York tech ecosystem. She is a panelist and speaker at technology and education meetups and conferences. And we're so thrilled to have Yvonne joining us today. And following Yvonne's presentation, we will host a panel with some of the terrific Tecnologicas themselves, and we are thrilled to welcome women from various stages of their STEM journeys. We will be joined by Luna Simon Gonzalez. Luna Simon Gonzalez is a current sophomore at Middlebury College in Vermont. Luna's love for the sciences began at a young age of two years old when taking classes at the American Museum of Natural History. Her introduction and interest in computer science started when she enrolled in the Bridge Up STEM program in ninth grade. Since joining Bridge Up STEM in high school, Luna has continued to learn about computer science throughout her school career. Before deciding to go to Middlebury, Luna went to music school for 13 years, and she has a chubby dash hound named Bella. We will also be joined by Paola Matta. Paola is an iOS engineer, a tech community leader, and a strong advocate for diversity in tech. Having successfully transitioned into the industry, she now regularly devotes time to supporting and guiding new programmers. Paola is currently building great cooking experiences for the New York Times. And we will finally be joined by Julia Sanchez. 
Juliette is a senior at Columbia University studying computer science and is a first generation Colombian American who grew up in Queens, New York. This past summer, she worked at the New York Times as a technology intern where she met a ton of amazing people and learned a lot. Once she graduates, Julieth hopes to pursue a career as a software engineer at the intersection of tech and social advocacy. So thank you to those three amazing women for joining us today. I can't wait for the conversation. And with that, I will turn it over to Yvonne to introduce us to Technologicas. Thank you, Marisa. Hello and welcome everybody. Like Marisa said, my name is Yvonne de la Peña and I currently lead the Technologicas Initiative at NCWIT. NCWIT convenes, equips and unites nearly 1,500 change leader organizations nationwide to increase the participation of girls and women in the field of computing. However, our emphasis on systemic change means that all groups benefit from our work. Next slide, please. Can we go? Yes, thank you, Marisa. Um, I actually want to invite everybody to take a look at the NC with uh, website when you have a moment. Uh, in there, you will find that there are many, many different ways in which uh, you could join us and um, interact with NC with. We have a, a, K -to a group for K-12 educators, college faculty, corporate corporations, and also nonprofit organizations. We also have programs such as aspirations in computing and counselors for computing. And if you're looking for research and statistics, definitely uh, click on the, on the link for that on the website. Next slide, please. The other thing that you will find on the website is the NC with awards that I wanna definitely encourage uh, Everybody to take a look. We have an award for students in college. We have one for students in high school, and we also have an award for educators. Applications for all three awards are currently open. Next. I want to thank the NGCT and Marisa for hosting us today. I also want to thank our great panelists for uh, generously giving of their time to tell their stories. And everybody who is here with us on this webinar, uh, taking time out of their super busy schedules. So the fact that Latinas and Hispanic women and girls are underrepresented in STEM is well known. And so I am very excited uh, for the conversation that we will be having here today. In fact, uh, Next slide, please. Technology Chicas came out of a, a conversation just like this one, and that conversation happened in Washington, D.C. in 2015. And during that conversation, stakeholders were tasked with finding ways to use media to address the issue of the underrepresentation of Latinas in STEM. And so the first campaign that Technology Chicas had uh, ran shortly after that conversation. And today we are very excited because we're working uh, to put together campaign number five. Next slide, please. However, today Technologicas is not just a media campaign. We also have a large group of Technologica ambassadors who do work in their communities and across the nation to help us address the issue of underrepresentation of Latinas in tech. And if you're wondering how you can engage with technology guys, definitely go take a look at our website. Uh, we have the videos for all the campaigns and also videos of some of the technology guys on the website. We also have a YouTube channel where we uh, have put all the campaign videos. Uh, you can follow us on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. We are constantly posting uh, events that we're doing and highlighting our technology guys. We also have a resources page that you can check out. We have a long list of uh, programs and resources in case you're interested. And finally, finally, please, please, like if you can think of a, a way that you wanna engage that is not on the website, that is not being addressed on the website, please feel free to reach out to us. You can send an email to technologicas at ncwit.org or you can definitely uh, email me directly. My email is right there on the slide. Thank you, everybody. 
Thank you, Marisa. Thank you, Yvonne, for, for giving us a little bit of background about Tecnologicas. Um, and we're going to dive in and hear a bit more about the, the women today who are on this call who are representing as Tecnologicas themselves. Um, and so I'm actually going to stop sharing my screen so we can see each other in this great conversation. And we are going to go ahead and first get started in a kind of prepared panel discussion, and then we will open it up to questions from the audience. I already see some coming through in the chat, so feel free to keep those going. When we open it up to question and answer, um, we will also offer to those in the audience who want to turn on their video cameras and unmute to ask your question live as well. Um, so. Welcome to Paola, Luna, and Juliet. Thank you so much for being here today. We're very happy to have you. Um, and our first question to kind of get started in this conversation is, how did you get engaged and interested in the field of computer science or technology? And anyone can feel free to jump right in. I can start. Um, um, like I like what was, was mentioned before, I started science C classes at the American Museum of Natural History. And once I graduated from the middle school program, I said, now what? Um, and I had two options and either continue within the natural sciences, something that I was very comfortable with or start something completely new, like computer science. And I decided on um, computer science. And from there on, I learned some computer languages, got a couple of internships, and have been having a lot of fun around even this past summer with my, with not my experience in my college classes, but rather the experience I got attending the program that I did, Bridge of STEM, um, I was able to um, gain an internship at NOAA this summer, which was really fun. Um, I can share about my background. Um, so. I feel like there's been several iterations of my interest in computer science. Uh, so I was exposed to it pretty young. Uh, I would say in like elementary school, we were writing little programs. I didn't know what I was doing. It was just a like fun game. Um, and then um, later in high school, I did take some computer programming classes. Um, and then when I, um, when I went to college, I, I chose not to continue with it because I actually wanted to, I thought I wanted to do something more creative and I thought I wanted to write. So um, fast forward, you know, years later into my career, I felt like I wasn't really going anywhere. I wasn't feeling challenged. And I started picking up uh, programming once again. Um, and it was like learning it all over again. Um, so I decided uh, at that point um, to actually pursue it as a career option. And, um, you know, it took a couple of years, but I've been doing it ever since. Um, so my experience is very similar um, to Luna's. Um, when I was growing up, I was always really interested um, in the sciences and always really curious about like the brain and how that worked. Um, but it wasn't until I applied to the same bridge up program when I was in ninth grade that I was exposed to computer science for the first time. Um, and reflecting back on that experience, um, I don't think I ever would have come across programming or computer science otherwise. Um, because my middle school and my high school didn't teach or have any computer science classes, maybe until I graduated. Um, so Bridge Up really opened the doors for me to learn about programming and have um, experiences through their internships and the mentorship they provided. And I, similar to Luna, I just like kept going at it um, and I majored it in, in college. Um, so I have also done a couple internships and Along the way, I've just learned more um, about how I want to apply my computer science knowledge. Um, so that's sort of what's changed along the way. Thank you. So I, I, I have a follow up question that kind of came into my mind as I was listening to each of you talk about your, your background and how you first got interested in this. I know there are a lot of educators or like program uh, leaders on this call in the audience today. And I know from, from our perspective of folks leading programming for girls and youth in STEM or technology, sometimes what feels like such a challenge is 
keeping the girls or the other um, underrepresented, if you want to, populations to continue coming back. Was there anything about your experience when you were younger that kind of inspired you or helped you to feel like you wanted to keep with this? Um, I think for me, the what kept me coming back was the community that the Bridge Up program like provided us. Um, we were like all girls. Um, we came back, came from like a, a diversity of like backgrounds um, and everyone was just so friendly. The, the sort of the space we were always in was very comfortable. Um, so I like felt safe in that space, um, especially with like all the, the staff, everyone was like really welcoming. Um, so I think at least for me, uh, the community was very important in helping me like sort of retain in this space. Um, and I realize that now that I'm like in college where I guess it's not, it doesn't feel as safe um, because there's like, so there's less women, there's like less BIPOC students. Um, so that's like something really that I noticed like once I, I went into college. I, I completely agree, um, as well as the idea that I didn't know about CompSci at all beforehand, and I thought it was kind of just like, oh, this is how you hack. This is, that's all, that's what you do. That's what they do in the movies, right? Um, but it wasn't until, like, I learned that you can apply this information to so many different fields of science or art or anything like that. Um, it's super applicable to anything in life as well as if you start somewhere, you can apply it in a completely different field, just because a lot of it has the same base knowledge and then you can build from there. Um, I think with a lot of other science fields or like me having gone to conservatory for like 13 years, I was always told, oh, you learn this, you do this, and then that's all you can do. But with CompSci, you have the ability to be able, you have like all these options and it really frees up that like generally limiting world that STEM can hold you to. Um, and so that's something just like realizing and reinforcing the idea. It's like, if this is what you do, this isn't like all end all, um, which was really like relieving for me. Um, and I think for me, I would say um, being exposed to um, computer science programming uh, at an early age and just being surrounded by uh, other people who look like me because I went to a very, I went to school in New York and it was very diverse and just seeing other other women, other people of color. Um, maybe I wasn't processing that in the moment, but I think it's what um, later on in my career, well, when I was deciding to change my career, I, I never had a doubt that I could do this because I had already seen other people doing it successfully. And that made a big difference, I think, in my mentality. And, and um, I wasn't hesitant to, um, to try to get my foot in the door. I love that, Paola. It's a, a true testament to the power of representation, as Yvonne was talking about when she was introducing the Tecnologicas initiative, right? Seeing people who, who look like you or who are from similar communities that you come from, you know, doing this really can make you feel like, oh, that's something I could try as well. Um, so uh, a lot of you, you've all talked about kind of your background and how you got interested in technology and computer science. Was there a role model or a mentor who sort of helped you along the way? And how did they support you? What types of support did they provide? Uh, I can speak to that effect. Uh, I, I don't think I've ever had someone who I officially called a mentor or who considered me a mentee, but I, at the same time, I've had, I feel like so many people have served as mentors, whether they knew it or not, um, or whether they'd call it that officially. Um, I think early in my career, people like Yvonne, seeing other people with other women who were doing really um, amazing work and in and, uh, and diversity as well. And um, I think throughout my career, um, there have been, you know, like um, other engineers, other mobile managers um, who have really tried to, to lift me up. Uh, I, specifically, I think of the person who hired me um, at the Times, uh, another uh, person of color, a Latino, uh, who just really wanted to give me a shot and knew that I could do well um, and really helped me advance. And then uh, even just like very, very informally, people have served as mentors. Um, recently, I had a conversation with another 
Athena in tech as she's a uh, working at, um, as a mobile manager now, uh, but also has an iOS background and was encouraging me uh, to apply for, for different roles, different opportunities. Like she was making me think a lot bigger. And this all happened in an Instagram like DM. It, it can happen at any point. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, the Instagram DM, I love that. You're right, like role models and, and that type of support can really come from almost anywhere and sometimes in places you maybe would least expect it to, right? I know sometimes I like ignore those DMs because I'm like, who's this messaging me? Uh, <laughs> so that's that's such a great little anecdote. I love that. Um, Luna or Juliette, anything you'd like to add? Sorry, my lights are like um, motion sensitive. So if I don't move for like a long time, they just shut off. Um, but when you asked that question, the first person that came to mind for me was my sister. Um, we had, There's like a pretty big age difference. Uh, she's like 15 years older than me. Um, but she sort of took on like a very motherly role when I was young. And she always like encouraged me and found like different science programs for me to participate in. And that's sort of how I found Bridge Up was through her. Um, and she is a doctor and she was so accomplished and um, she was sort of my role model, um, seeing her like accomplish um, going through med school and residency, like made me realize that even though we're in different fields, like if she's like breaking the glass ceiling, like so can I. Yeah, and I think for me, um... It was some of the teachers and mentors at the Bridge of STEM program, and then there and like then going on forward. But um, they didn't like look down at on any of us, and they would have like open conversations. If we got there early, we were able to talk about how our day had gone. Um, and in the past, a lot of like my experiences in school had been very schooling, this is what you learn and stuff like that. While my science classes at the museum were a little bit different, um, Bridge Up really just opened the conversation. It's like, hey, yeah, and this could apply to that, that test that you took the other day, right? Um, and so just, just being really relaxed um, and just making sure like this, like what I was mentioning before, just having that like creative outlet while also like talking to other people, um, especially people who are like, have all this experience and stuff, you feel just really cool <laughs> um, starting off, so yeah. Great, thank you. And I, I feel like this sort of theme of interdisciplinary has come up um, throughout a lot of the things you have all said, like Paola saying how she kind of transitioned from more of a writing career into now her work at New York Times on the cooking side of things. And Luna and Juliette talking about different ways to combine technology and computer science with other avenues like social justice, or perhaps, you know, Luna, maybe who knows music or things like that, right? It's just really Really interesting to think about, um, you know, once you understand that there are infinite possibilities, that interdisciplinary component can start to feel really exciting. And rather than STEM feeling like a box of like, oh, only these types of people enter into it, it really kind of breaks down those barriers and, and lets you really see beyond. Um, and so with that, are there any positive changes you've experienced or not? Maybe there have been some negative moments um, in your STEM learning or your career so far. Um, I can try answering that. Um, so for me, um, my freshman year of college um, when I was taking like all the introductory like CS classes um, up until sophomore year I went through like a time where um, I became like very sort of like bored of like the very technical side of computer science um, and I wasn't really seeing sort of like the interdisciplinary like parts of computer science that we've spoken about um, and during that time it felt like a very sort of like technical process or I, like I had this idea of just like a programmer like in their basement just like typing for hours and hours and hours um 
And it wasn't until like I went to like a panel at my university that I started learning about how um, like there's also like the machine learning side of computer science and how it can be used. Like they were doing research on analyzing like people's use of language across the internet um, and connecting that to like instances of like uh, bullying or like gun violence. Um, and that like really interested me and sort of like reignited um, the passion for computer science that I felt like I had in high school and that I had lost along the way. Um, so yeah, that's like a, a positive change for me. Um, Marissa, just uh, wanted to clarify, uh, did you mean changes in ourselves or changes in the industry or both? Both, either <laughs> one. <laughs> Okay. Uh, well, on a personal level, I feel like um, I, I have grown so much since starting out in my uh, uh, tech career, my programming, iOS, whatever, uh, engineering career. Um, and I, I've gained so much confidence and I've been able to also um, share uh, my experience and pass it on to people who are coming into the industry, um, which is probably the most rewarding thing. Um, and as far as the um, changes in the industry, I would say uh, there, there's a lot more awareness around um, the issue with diversity and, and getting um, people from different backgrounds in. Um, some companies have made it a goal to, to you know, improve their hiring or to uh, you know, maybe just get, get improve diversity overall in their organizations. Um, there's a lot more discussion about it. And I think we're trying to maybe take down some of the barriers to entry um, to get into, um, into the industry, which I think are all positives. Um, it's, a, it's a slow process, I think, but I, I've already seen improvement in the last, uh, what is it, six, seven years that I've been around? It's a while now. <laughs> yeah, um, I think a positive is that uh, in one of my computer science classes last year, um, my second semester at college, I was expecting to have that stereotypical uh, class, computer science class, and when you're going to a predominantly white institution, um, was really looking forward to being like the only BIPOC and or female like uh, coder there. And I was completely surprised <laughs> to see that um, I, we were in the majority. Um, and my professor was also BIPOC and a woman. And so that was just like a really cool, and it was just like there, like it wasn't, a, it didn't necessarily, it wasn't necessarily promoted or anything like that. It was just, it happened to be, and that was just like a cool, like, oh, wow. And it's a nice little like realization that I'm just like a part of this new wave of um, like new coders and a new community with diversity um, in computer science. That's really exciting. I, I, it's really terrific to hear um, just different like college experiences, Julieth and Luna, like either, you know, maybe feeling like the courses weren't, weren't quite getting to that interdisciplinary excitement that you had felt when you were younger and finding a way to bring that back and get that back again, or with Luna entering into the first course and realizing, wow, maybe things are changing. And like, like Paola was saying, maybe these shifts that have been occurring slowly over time in the industry are starting to make their way down for the next generation who will enter into the career in the future. I feel like that's a really, the, hearing those are really, makes me feel hopeful and excited about the future of where technology and CS might be going. Um, and so our last kind of prepared question before we open it up to the audience questions is, what piece of advice would you give to a young person who's interested in entering into tech? I'll speak since I'm no longer a young person. <laughs> um, I will say, um, I mean, first that, you can just a word of encouragement that you can absolutely do it um, and that there are many of us already here um, who can help you help guide you um, but also um, also oh no I lost my train of thought 
Yeah. So I guess what I wanted to say is what discouraged me initially, uh, I, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the, the programming aspect, but I was worried about what it would, um, you know, whether it made sense for me to do as a career, because I didn't think it was creative enough, as I mentioned, and having experienced it now, and, and, and also because uh, technology itself has changed, and now we have these awesome mobile devices that didn't exist when I was in high school. <laughs> um, and uh, it's, it's, a lot, it's a lot more fun than um, maybe people quite think it is initially. And so also, I would try to explore as many different possibilities um, within tech because it's, it's huge. Um, and you can merge some of your other interests, uh, whether it's you know music, art, whatever. I, everything can somehow have some connection to technology these days. Um, so you you're not just limited to just writing code and and being very uh, precise and nothing else. Thank you, Paula. Um, that's some some great advice. And I know Luna and Juliet, you know, you are young young adults yourselves, but would you have a word of advice for maybe younger students who are, are thinking about going into technology? Yeah, just uh, just reiterating what Paula said, like just because you don't necessarily see someone that doesn't look like you uh, doesn't mean they don't exist. And that's also not a reason to stop. Um, uh, someone could be the first within their fields and not even realize it. And that may not be the promoting factor of being like, oh, I'm gonna be the first. It could just be something that you really, really enjoy. Um, so uh, yeah, there's so many different ways that technology can be applied into everyday life as we always see, as, as we're seeing right now, um, as well as just something fun such as this is something I've been wondering how to have a better solution for this calculator. I don't like this calculator. Let's make a new one. Like even simple daily solutions you can come up with on your own with STEM. So it doesn't have to be necessarily a career, but it can definitely help out because it has so many different ways of being applied. Um, yeah, sort of to like build on that. Um, I would say that like, you know, you don't have to like, be in love with just like the technical part of like computer science like your passion for computer science can be like intersectional with like other things like if you're really passionate about medicine and you enjoy computer science but you really like are really passionate about like those two together like that's that's like more than like fine like that's like great like you can um like pursue like in computer science like so many different like fields you can go honestly go into any field as like a computer science like person um just as long as like you're passionate about it um and it's something that you genuinely enjoy you'll you'll be just fine thank you all right and with with that we're going to open it up to questions from the audience um we have Several that came through in the chat, if anyone would like to ask their question live on camera or with their uh, microphone unmuted, please just like send a quick message in the chat there so I know and can call on you. Um, otherwise, I'm going to get started with ones that came through the chat earlier on. We had a question from Trisha, who was asking, what do you wish was available to you? as you were exploring STEM in your youth? More mentors, more programs, more accessibility. So if anyone, any of our panelists want to uh, jump in and respond. I guess just more programs. Like I honestly didn't know what computer science would entail uh, when I was younger. Um, I knew about the natural sciences, and I think that's also like an easier science for that a lot of people have thought that kids, it's easier for them to manage because it's physical. Um, but uh, I definitely think like I've seen how some kids just can get super immersed in learning how to use their iPad, something like that. Um, uh, so just having more programs, even if it's something small, even if it's something just like 
a guardian with its uh, with their child's working through like hey let's try to get this together and also potentially applying that to reading and writing um and i've seen a couple of things like that and that would just be cool to see more of them um, what I, I wish i'd had oh sorry <laughs> Okay, what I, what I wish I had had uh, was more um, uh, like, is it advising maybe is the right word? Um, for somebody to kind of tell me what my options were and what I, you know, what I could do with, uh, with computer science, what, what um, opportunities I would be able to explore. I just, I wish I'd known more of that before I, I'd had this interlude in my twenties where, um, uh, I sort of was lost and, and not knowing where to go and then ended up, you know, finding computer science all over again. Um, I wish there was like CS pro like classes um, at like my middle school or like my high school, um, sort of like more like local, because um, when I did bridge up, uh, it was like a almost like a two hour commute, like going and coming back. So it wasn't something that was like accessible to me, but I did it because I really enjoyed the program. So it would have been really nice if like growing up, there was like a computer science program um, at the school that I was going to. Um, and now that I, I actually work as a teacher, um, teaching kids how to like code on scratch. Um, and you really, you really see how like just the little kids like sort of eat up all the, the information they're learning and they're just like really creative and love using like the block. So it's, you think it's like maybe it would be something that like little kids wouldn't enjoy because we see it as something that's so technical or like complicated um but like if you like sort of the way scratch does it you sort of like bring it down to the more concepts it's something that like small kids or like middle school students can like 100 percent like learn and enjoy Thank you. I love that. That was, I feel like really helpful just to get that perspective on, you know, what you didn't have that you wish you could have. Um, and we have Allison here who's asked to join the conversation. Go ahead, Allison. Thanks. Um, so I work for Beyond School Bells, which is kind of an after school network in Nebraska. And part of my job is um, to take the lead on the Million Girls Moonshot project here. And so I just have a question if each of the panelists could speak a little bit. If there was one important thing that you would tell people who are creating these programs for girls to incorporate or make sure not to forget about, what would it be? I think just being able, I know for me, a one particular thing about Bridge Up was that we were applying, obviously like this is a high school program, so it could be a little bit more complicated, but um, just uh, being able to apply what I was learning past like Printello World to say, uh, to like look, we were looking at databases that were from actual data. Like we looked at flu DNA. Like, so I was like, I know about the flu. I know DNA. These are two really cool concepts. I didn't know what a database was, but um, being able to apply those new ideas to something that I already kind of knew and didn't know could have any connection to technology in any way um, was really helpful to me. And also like my internship in my sophomore year with Bridge Up was with astrophysics, something that I had previously learned about and uh, and astronomy like you see the stars well not much in new york but you see the stars and you can learn as much as you want but it wasn't until like i was able to create a 3d map of the stars that i could touch the i could touch the planets i could touch the stars i could see what they were like um so just being able to make big ideas more manageable because it's really hard Sometimes, at least for me as a very visual learner, to be able to code for a while or learn about functions or dictionaries or anything like that without being able to see how they're being applied. 
So I'm definitely front end, I'm sorry, back end people. Um, but yeah, just being able to see how that can be applied into different areas, as well as things that I may already be familiar with um, was really, really helpful. Um, I, I would definitely agree with, um, with Luna as well. I, I think seeing a real world application makes a huge difference. Um, and then having those opportunities to, um, to collaborate and to work with others and bounce ideas off of each other, that's, that makes, uh, it makes it fun and inspiring, I think. Um, so I, I've had the pleasure of hosting hackathon events um, not hosting, but uh, being a judge or, you know, being involved in some way in hackathon events. And it's, it's, it's really uh, amazing to see how inspired the, the students get uh, when, when they're seeing how, how they can solve problems and, um, you know, together by working together. Um, I would say to be like aware of like the different like learning styles that students have. Um, because at least one of the things that like I struggled with is that um, I'm like also a visual person. Uh, so sometimes when I would just like see like a piece of code, I didn't like really like understand it like on the first try, like I would really have to like see what like every part was doing, like printing things or looking at what was happening like behind the scenes. Um, so I think that's something that's really helpful is just to be aware of like the many different ways that students learn and if something doesn't work for one student like you you keep trying until like something clicks thank you so much everyone and thank you allison for that great question um and i i think you know i put my little reflection there in the chat luna from what for what you were saying and i think one other thing that i would add just from my perspective of having these terrific women on our call today who are all technologicas is that that notion of representation does matter so maybe using some of the videos and resources and maybe reaching out to technologicas and seeing if any of these women would be able to speak with the youth in your programs is another way to help people who may not otherwise feel like they belong in a technology or computer science space, um, see someone who looks like them doing it and succeeding and being passionate. Um, and so we had a few questions come through from Adrian. So I'm gonna start with one that was specifically for Luna asking, did your arts and music training help you in your computer science studies? Yes and no. Um, I was mostly trained in classical music, which was very, had its rules, we did it a particular way. Um, and it wasn't until later on in high school that I started really reaching out into any other fields of music. Um, but at some points I was able to see like if I, like really weird ways, um, not any particular, it's like, oh, uh, this scale is really similar to this function, nothing like that. But sometimes if I was going through the logic of uh, pseudo coding something, um, I was looking at it the same way that I would memorize a piece in some weird, uh, weird way, like formatting, okay, which ones are the hard bits? How do I have to focus on certain weird like fingering, like fingering stuff um, for, uh, compared to how do I break this function down? But I think that was just my brain like using similar parts of it rather than um, specific music concepts connecting to specific computer science concepts. Thank you. Um, that's that's really interesting to think about. Yeah, how in some ways it does it did relate, and how in other ways it seemed to like maybe not so much relate. And that notion of kind of how your brain trains to work through complex, um, you know, pieces is I do feel like yeah, there probably is some overlap in the parts of your brain that is firing when you're learning a really hard piece of composition and music versus learning you know a new coding language or something like that. Um, Another question from Adrian was, if any of you as panelists and speakers today have suggestions of positive role models from popular culture, like TVs, movies, or books of women in technology or STEM. Uh, 
I have one. Okay, I just had to search up that I was saying the right name. Um, so uh, like Juliet, um, I also teach, but I'm not doing a STEM program right now. It's actually a STEAM program, um, very new, but uh, we go through different modules of different science fields just to get young girls or young girl identifying um, people to get interested in STEAM and all that. And we usually go through books having to do with the module and then going along with what we were learning and two people that have been really helpful in them understanding the concept a bit more as well as getting interested in the subject is that for like ecosystems and the environment, Meg Lohman, who was an arborist, who's really cool and May Jemison, who was the first black astronaut to go up into space. Um, and most of these girls are also BIPOC. So being able to learn about May was really, really inspiring to them. Um, and I also just think uh, like picturesque books um, can be really helpful for younger students to be able to apply this knowledge, going back to the idea of visual learners um, or auditory learners, because then they see someone else who did it and someone who looks like them, like Mae Jemison, um, and they say at the end of the program, oh my god, I want to be an astronaut. And we're like, yes, of course, of course you can. Um, so yeah, so Meg Lohman and Mae Jemison have been really cool uh, people, at least for young, uh, young scientists. Thank you. Anyone else? I'm sure there are, but I don't remember like any off the top of my head. <laughs> no worries. I was just thinking, I was just going to type in the chat. Um, I, I've been really into Miranda Cosgrove's show, Mission Unstoppable, uh, lately, which is just has so many like cool, fantastic women in STEM and STEAM careers that get highlighted. And it's just like in a shown in a really like fun, approachable way for teens and tweens. Um, so that's one I would recommend checking out. And so we have, I'm going to just have us do one more question from the audience before we start to close it out. We're getting close to the end of our hour. So we had a question from Nadia asking if you have any suggestions around changing the narrative that Latinx women do not belong in computer science. So there may be a narrative out there that it is not a space for Latinx women. How might we change that narrative? I think one way is not necessarily conforming to the ideas that a lot of people um, put out there. It's very easy to be like, oh, I finally arrived to this point in my career or um, in my lifetime with technology or wherever you are. Um, so let me try to fit in as much as possible because this is enough, um, but not shying down from those opportunities, even though other people say, uh, like, yeah, maybe it's not the best idea to do this, uh, not letting those opinions kind of like hit you that much, even though it's hard. If a lot of people are telling you, don't do this, this is a bad idea, you're going to want to try to listen to them, but um, kind of just finding the community of people who believe in you is really important. And that sometimes isn't necessary, doesn't feel like enough, but it will be. I have the, the honor, I would say, of knowing so many, uh, so many Latinas in tech. Um, and I've, I've made it a point to get to know, to get to know them and, and to, you know, I've done a lot of meetup organizing too. So like even creating those communities um, if they don't already exist. Um, I have just, at this point, I, I can't, it can't be denied. Like I know so many if, uh, it, to the point where like if someone is trying to hire one in, at work, I, I already have several people in mind that I could recommend. Um, so uh, it, it's just, it's been a matter of cr creating that community and being very intentional about seeking it out. Um, that has uh, enabled me to, that narrative doesn't even exist in my mind anymore. Yeah, I completely agree with like the both of you. Um, 
I think like as you like rise up like the ladder in your career like always like be conscious of like maybe like where you started from um and like mentor people who are just starting off in their career or like Paola like you were saying like you know recommend um different opportunities to Latinas that you know are applying um or like if you're in a position of power like advocate for those people um because sometimes like our names aren't heard unless we have someone who's in the room um that can advocate for you um so I think those those are important but yeah I, I agree like the narrative is not there's no place in it um in my mind either <laughs> Thank you all so much. I feel like that theme of um, community, the importance of either building community if it doesn't already exist or finding that community within like-minded people um, has come up again and again throughout this webinar today. And I think it was you know, really clear in all three of you how you talked about that closing remarks. And I think it's a testament when you, many of you have said, you know, that negative narr narrative isn't even a part of my mindset right now in, you know, my career or in my learning. And I think that is probably a testament to the community and the people that have been around you and are supporting you in this journey in the field of tech and computer science. So that's really amazing and inspiring to hear. Um, as we come to a close, I would love for folks in the audience to take just one or two minutes and we'd love for you to respond with a quick action item. Um, so this webinar was partially in celebration of Hispanic Heritage Month um, and also just to inspire Latinas in STEM and technology and to hear about this program and these great women. So how will you or have you celebrated Hispanic Heritage Month in your programs? Um, any ideas you have to share with our audience today, please go ahead and type it in the chat. We always love sharing resources and program ideas. So we'd love to hear from you. And I've already seen um, some folks sharing like media books and things like that, as well as some events that are occurring um, on other websites and in other organizations. So thanks for utilizing that, that chat. Yes, I was thinking about Ellen Ochoa as well, sharing information on Latinx astronauts like Ellen Ochoa. It is, um, is it space, space week, space month, world space week this week. So love combining that with our Hispanic Heritage Month celebrations. That's terrific. Uh, celebrating Latina STEM leaders in US history and looking to extend that to a worldview. Fantastic. Um, using out of school time STEM classes, Girls Who Code, and others. Participating in Great Minds and STEM conference, a cybersecurity hackathon, AI trainings. Wow, there's so many great opportunities out there. So we love to hear about those. Um, and I am going to go ahead and just share my screen one final time to close us out today. So give me one moment here. There we go. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much to our fantastic panelists and Yvonne for sharing today about Tecnologicas and your journey in tech. It was really a great conversation and of such value. And the National Girls Collaborative Project will um, share the recording of this webinar out with all of our registrants um, when it's ready to be shared. And we'd also like to let you know about some upcoming events. We have on October 19th, Bright 2021, sharing strategies and learnings from an online summer STEM program for girls. On November 3rd, we have hosting Girls Steam Ahead with NASA events, tips on using free NASA resources. So those of you interested and excited about Space Week right now, it won't be Space Week then, but you can keep the excitement going. Um, and on November 8th, we have innovative strategies from the field, leveraging the If Then collection. And I would also like to remind folks to please take a moment to um, complete a closing survey, a post webinar survey. Thanks Kata for popping that in the chat there. These surveys help us learn how our webinars are going. Uh, they also give you an opportunity to share about topics and resources you would like to learn more about in a webinar context. So thank you so much. And we hope to see you again at an NGCP webinar soon. And thank you, thank you to our terrific 
group of speakers today for spending time with us and being honest, open, and just having a terrific conversation around Latinas in technology.